That was at PUC in 1979, baptized Thanksgiving weekend there by Mara Spenden. I had a terrible case of poison. I was really, really miserable. Um, but, uh, uh, your voice doesn't sound the same when you're hearing it recorded. It just sounds like, this is that person? That's a terrible voice. Um, but um, I did ultimately find God's calling in my life. Uh, I remember I was uh, doing Bible work, band ministry in New York. I was for a time working with our Jewish Bible worker, Frida Rubenstein. And we talk about how uh, the Adventist message relates to Jews. And she'd say, well, then we have the health message. Jews are very interested in health. And by that time, you know, I, I was a hippie vegetarian before I was an Adventist. The Adventist diet was um, a step in the wrong direction for me. Uh, it was much less healthy than what I was accustomed to. Um, but, um, I, you know, I decided very quickly that I wasn't going to be a doctor. I couldn't stand the sight of blood. And for various reasons, none of the other sorts of health professions uh, interested me. I said, well, you know, then there's the Sabbath. We have the Sabbath in common and religious liberty. Prophecy had been very significant in my conversion and was very near and dear to my heart. In fact, I barely survived the onslaught of Jews for Judaism trying to, uh, an organization designed to snatch young Jewish converts to Christianity out of the clutches of the church. Uh, but, uh, but it was my depth of understanding of prophecy that, that saved me. They didn't have it answers for all of the messianic prophecies that they knew from evangelicals, but they'd never encountered an Adventist before. They didn't know Daniel 7, they didn't know Daniel 9, uh, and uh, uh, got out of there by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> but um, religious liberty caught my imagination because, after all, in these last days. Uh, Sabbath observers, regardless of their denomination, they're all going to be in the same boat if, if our understanding of prophecy is even remotely correct. But, you know, there's one thing that I think Adventists have, have, have failed to grasp. Jews are the ones who've always been the scapegoat, right? And we're going to be, it, it may very well be that we're scapegoated along with the Jews because we're also Sabbath observers. And I think it's very significant. Uh, Dana Milbank, your uh, or Washington Post columnist, this past uh, week, about a week ago, published a column. And he said that what he's finding is that for the first time, Jews are asking the question of their rabbis, of one another, a question that they have not been forced to ask here in the United States, which for so long has provided sanctuary from centuries of hardship, of persecution, of instability. The question is, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? I posted something on my Facebook page suggesting the Jews are the canary in the coal mine. Um, <clears throat> my brother was very upset when we spoke on the phone today. He felt that President Biden's speech about uh, the threat to democracy was the best thing that we've heard in this country since the likes of JFK or FDR, and that it was completely panned by the major media. And, and uh, he's got media going all day long. He's in the family business, if you will. He's a, a day trader. And so he's got, you know, various news playing constantly. Um, we're in the deep stuff. And so I want to take the time 
tonight and especially tomorrow afternoon, take a look at what we Adventists say we believe, if we really do, and relate it to what's going on. And especially this af tomorrow afternoon, uh, we're going to take a look at Christian nationalism, which um, you'll see my thesis at the end of the slides tonight. I believe that the religion that we see portrayed in Revelation 13, the, the idolatrous counterfeit, is the dominant religion in America today. Okay, now, do I have a crystal ball? Do I know where we're going? I obviously do not. All we can do is stay awake, pay attention. That's what Jesus taught us to do, right? And tomorrow, I think I'll probably invoke. I'm inclined tomorrow. <clears throat> I've been praying about this. I'm not going to give you my canned sermon. We're going to talk about the judgment. And of course, we have to conclude with what Jesus tells us that we should be doing in light of his imminent return. Because he, he tells us in Matthew 25, he gives us all these parables about how we're supposed to stay awake and be faithful servants. But no matter how much we may, you know, see that, you know, when you see the, the fig tree, you know, the, you know, leaf out, you know, that summer is near and, you know, he's at the door and all of that. But then he says, guess what? You're all going to be asleep, right? All the virgins are asleep. So no matter how much you try to stay awake, you're going to be asleep. But what are we supposed to do? You know, okay, be faithful servants and be about what, whatever. But then he says, what? He says, those who are the sheep are doing what? They're giving a cup of cold water to the thirsty, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. They're welcoming the stranger, they're taking care of one another, and they're doing it to one another as if they were doing Jesus. Right? So it's not really like we're supposed to do great deeds and be, you know, doers of fantastic feats. We're supposed to be loving, loving Christians and care about one another. I think that's where we see real distinction. We're going to talk about the counterfeit Holy Spirit. Tonight, let's do a little bit of a review and take a look at, okay, well, let's see, Maybe this is, let's turn the switch. Okay, there we go. And I call this the worship of the American beast because um, after all, we Adventists believe that the second beast of Revelation 13 United States and the passage talks about the worship and and so this one this was really my first my opening for camp meeting and mind you I thought the Arizona camp meeting crowd was going to be more conservative than it turned out to be in fact uh Jonathan, one of your colleagues, Greg West Webster, asked me at some point if I'd gotten any death threats. I didn't even get death threats at uh, at Fallbrook. <laughs> oh, all right. But, uh, you know, let's take a look at the religion of the beast. What is this? All right. Well, I can't read this very well on this screen, but. This is a passage in Revelation 13 that is the mark of the beast passage that describes the United States prophecy. So let's just start read it. I saw another beast coming up from the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but was speaking like a dragon. He exercised all the ruling authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and those who inhabit it worship the first beast the one whose lethal wound had been healed. He performed momentous signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs he was permitted to perform on behalf of the beast, he deceived those who live on the earth. 
He told those who live on the earth to make an image to the beast who had been wounded by the sword, but still lived. The second beast was empowered to give life to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause those, all those who did not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He also caused everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to obtain a mark in the right hand or on their forehead. So no one was allowed to buy or sell unless he bore the mark of the beast, that is his name or his number. Different elements of that before were through. All right, but let me start here because Actually, this is kind of out of order. So, one of the problems that we have in understanding the book of Revelation is that we are millennia, two millennia removed, and we live in a culture that is essentially Greek thinking. Okay. And we are far removed from the Judaism that. John was immersed in. Revelation is a Jewish book. And the scholars tell us, and I don't pretend to be a scholar as such or a theologian, but I try to think about what the text says and to learn from our scholars. Uh, they tell us that there's virtually not a single line in the entire book that doesn't somehow borrow or reference something in the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. Now, you know, in chapter one, John refers to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I rather think those are better terms to describe the two uh, divisions of scripture that we commonly refer to as old and new. John refers to them as the word of God is the Hebrew scriptures and the testimony of Jesus is what we call the New Testament, the uh, collected gospels and writings of Paul, right? The letters. Um, another way of thinking about when in Revelation 14, uh, we read about here are they who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Uh, it's the word of God. It's, it's the scripture. It's the gospels. So mark of the beast. Where is it? It's in the forehead. It's in the hand. It's a counterfeit. It's not some, you know, computer in Belgium, or it's not some microchip that, you know, is uh, part of uh, the vaccine, right? It's a counterfeit. What is it a counterfeit of? Three times in the Torah, Jews are commanded to put God's teaching and instruction in little boxes and wrap them on the forehead and the hand. Now, the first time, I'll go back here. Oh, maybe I yep. I guess you're out of order in the slide deck. The very first time is in Exodus 13, before the Jews have crossed the Red Sea even. Here they are with the Egyptian army in hot pursuit. They're not out of harm's way. They're quaking in their boots. And God commands them, when I deliver you into the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, what are you going to do? You're going to teach your children. You're going to put these in boxes and wear them on your forehead and on your hands. And you're going to teach your children what God did for you and delivering you from bondage in Egypt and leading you into the promised land. Now, <clears throat> Exodus, I'm talking to black church about the meaning of the Exodus story, <laughs> Jonathan. You do know that in the American South before the Civil War, the southern, the white southern establishment created a special slave 
Bible with the Exodus story removed. Wow. Wow. Why do you suppose they might do that? A story about how God freed slaves from Egypt? Couldn't have that in a slave economy, could we? That wouldn't go over so well. The Exodus story is a type of the plan of salvation, Amen. isn't it? It's the gospel. God frees us from bondage to sin and brings us into eternal freedom in the promised land. Yeah. New Jerusalem is our ultimate home, isn't it? So if the Exodus story that we're supposed to find here as a rem remembrance of who God is and what he's done for us and what he will do for us, his plan of salvation. Mark of the Beast is a counterfeit of the plan of salvation. There's a, a counterfeit type of salvation. I've got some more slides. I'm going to make a suggestion of what I think is involved with that before we're done. The other two times that it's mentioned is in Deuteronomy 6 and 11. Deuteronomy 6 is the scripture that is read, recited in every synagogue service. The Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I command you this day shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your houses and gates. Something we still do to this day. Right? You've seen Jewish homes and businesses with the mezuzah on the door. It's a reminder. You know, some of these traditions, Adventism is very iconoclastic. We don't have a good set of traditions. My daughter hasn't been terribly religious, but she loves the traditions around Sabbath, lighting of candles, Hanukkah. Um, all of, you know, we have undervalued um, traditions as a means of, of not only teaching our children, but binding them to a, a lifestyle of faith. They're, they're, they're really, really helpful. Now, can traditions become, you know, rote? Uh, you know, how many times have we done communion service and it's been kind of, going through the motions, right? That can happen. But on a good day, communion service is powerful, right? You know, but that's the nature of, of, of the beast, as it were, of, of the, you know, of the human heart, that it's not always going to have that same, that same power. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. There's a counterfeiting of our bonding, of our intimacy with our Lord and Savior, God. So if, if the Shema is all about our belonging to God and his belonging to us and that relationship, then what is the mark? How is the mark of the beast to counterfeit? There's really a counterfeit God. It's not the worship of the creator. It's the worship of the beast in its image. It's a counterfeit. We tend to create Jesus in our own image. And that's why. And I've, I ask questions. I ask questions like, why is the final proclamation of the gospel a call to return to the worship of the creator? And I was reading a passage. I don't know if any of you have seen there was a, a mini documentary series on Netflix about the family called The Family, based on the book by the same name, about a, a Christian organization that converts people in power around the world. They've sponsored the, 
National Prayer Breakfast, the President's Prayer Breakfast in Capitol Hill every year for decades now. The writer of that book, I don't know, not relevant to anything else. He says in a different writing project, he went in search of the American Jesus, and he was surprised at how many Jesuses he found. You know, in, in South Central LA, he found a, a Jesus wearing baggy shorts and, you know, sporting gang colors in a Orlando mega church. It was a, uh, a Jesus of the prosperity gospel who wanted everybody to drive a Beamer. In Greenwich Village, it was a Jesus in drag, you know, and, and there were several other Jesuses. I don't remember all of them, but I remember thinking myself, when I was a kid, and all I knew about Jesus was what I learned from the Doobie Brothers. Jesus is just all right with me, right? <laughs> but, but there were two Jesuses back then that I knew. You know, the black Jesus, remember the black Jesus? He had a big afro, right? <laughs> and the white Jesus had kind of dirty, light brown, shoulder length hair wore flowing white robes, and they weren't Birkenstocks, you know, his sandals, but um, obviously the white Jesus was a hippie, so he was one of us, and it struck me how we all create Jesus in our own image. We create a familiar Jesus. Now, the Adventist Jesus obviously doesn't drink or smoke. Um, I don't think the Adventist Jesus really ate that fish after his resurrection on the beach. He, he must have been a vegan, right? Um, so um, we'll stop there. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to tease churches and say, if, if you know, if you want to be an Adventist, you have to learn to sin like we do. <laughs> You know, and, and, and maybe it's offered in, in good, clean fun, but the reality is that we do tend to, to bring Jesus down to our level. And our Jesus is okay with our sins, but not with the other guy's sins, right? And the Jesus that we create in our own image has no power to save us. And that's why God calls us to return to the worship of the creator, the one who has the power to recreate us in his own image, right? So if we understand the genuine, the phylacteries and the meaning of God's mark on our foreheads, the seal of God is placed where? On the forehead. So the mark of the beast is a counterfeit, right? It's a counterfeit of the plan of salvation. It has a counterfeit Jesus. And what we're going to see tomorrow is there's also a counterfeit Holy Spirit. And I think that's, that is, well, the question that I'm going to take, to take up in the morning, Jonathan, is this. In the 20th century, we saw a quantity and quality of evil that is unsurpassed in human history with the Holocaust and all kinds of other atrocities um, and all over the planet. And so if God did not see fit to intervene and say enough is enough, and it's time to put a stop to all this hu human misery and evil, the question is, what will finally bring God to say that's it? Is that, see, I think we need to be asking the questions. Is that a good question? So let's talk about this beast with the two horns, like the lamb speaking as a dragon. For starters, Culturally, I think, I, I don't know if, if, if we believe this theologically, but we seem to have this, this idea that the United States in our history has been the lamb, Christ-like and these 
wonderful principles of equality and freedom and justice, you know, the American way, right? And that the future is the dragon and the Sunday laws. But again, I'm speaking in a black church. Well, and we know that the history of the United States has plenty of dragon in it, don't we? And I don't think I need to go into excruciating detail, but um, let's see. Uh, African slaves were not immigrants, right? Um, in the text, the Greek tense is an imperfect tense, both for the lamb-like horns and the dragon speaking, which is to say it's both the, the lamb-likeness and the dragon speaking are actions that began in the past, they are incomplete. They continue to the present and the future. The lamb and the dragon have been contending for the American soul from the beginning. So yes, there are Christ-like principles in our nation that we have never lived up to, but they are wonderful principles. Uh, we've also had dragon-like conduct. <clears throat> We Adventists tend to be careless in our read of scripture because we read Ellen White and we think we know what scripture means because we've read her interpretation. I have no quibble with her interpretation. I simply insist on reading the text and making sure I think about the meaning of the text and the symbols. Horns, we have two horns like a lamb. What are horns a symbol of in prophecy? of power in daniel daniel 7 daniel 8 we have a significant world power back in in the day symbolized by a single little horn representing the consolidation of civil and religious authority two horns the imagery represents a separation of power now, there's two phrases that describe what our Constitution does that are not what our Constitution says. Our Constitution separates powers. We talk about the separation of powers. And we do that if you read the Federalist Papers and our founding fathers, because they wanted to ensure against consolidating too much power, which leads to tyranny. And so we have the three branches of government, but we also have the differentiation between federal, state, and local government. So we separate power in order to protect civil and religious freedom. We also separate civil and religious power, the separation of church and state, at least we used to. The wall of separation Jefferson spoken of is virtually a pile of rubble these days. Let's see here. So really it's, you know, the prophecy says it's the two horns that are lamb-like. It's how we structurally uh, deal with power in order to enhance the opportunities for human freedom and uh, prosperity. That's the, the secret of our greatness. And, and, and this is a Protestant concept, really, <clears throat> that we separate church and state. Some of the earliest uh, thinkers about this come from the Radical Reformation. And when the Anabaptists, who believed uh, that you had to uh, be of age and make a conscious commitment to Christ in order to be baptized, well, they were persecuted, and frequently they would be drowned. You want to be baptized? We'll baptize you. And, you know, it, it didn't take very long for them to 
to conceive of the notion that since when is the state uh, called by God to arbitrate theological differences, right? Why does the state get to say that those who advocate infant baptism are right and we're wrong? And they understood that religion was not the business of the state and, and there should be religious freedom. Well, let's take a look at, some, at how some of these lamb-like principles were expressed uh, by our founding fathers. Now, Thomas Jefferson wanted to be known uh, on his tombstone for three things. You know what they were? Well, the obvious is he drafted what important document? Declaration of Independence, and he founded a great institution that was sullied by a march in 2017, University of Virginia, right? And, and you do recall that they weren't only racist, um, you know, neo-Nazi marchers, but what were they chanting there in Charlottesville? You? Oh, Jews will not replace us right? Because the replacement theory is not just people of color. <sighs> Jefferson wanted to be known for the Virginia statute of religious freedom. Whereas, and this is just a little piece of the preamble, but it's brilliant. Whereas almighty God hath created the mind free. I don't know that he even believed in a, an active involved God, but he was expressing these concepts that people could relate to, and he expressed them very well. Whereas almighty God hath created the mind free that all attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens. What is he talking about? Restrictions, penalties, fines, etc. You know, if you don't worship the right way, if you're a preacher preaching like the Baptists did, itinerant preachers, they didn't have licenses and they'd get arrested and be thrown in jail for preaching without a license. All attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens or civil incapacitations and only to beget habits of hypocrisy and meanness and therefore are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion, who being Lord both of body and mind, yet chose not to propagate it, that is to say the faith, by coercions on either, either body or mind, as was in his almighty power to do. They didn't have, um, you know, spell check and, and, and uh, you know, editing back then. They wrote these ridiculously long run on sentences, but I think you catch, it's a fantastic sentence. That the impious presumption of legislators and rulers, civil as well as ecclesiastical, he was anti-clerical. He was very hostile to, uh, to church authority, but he understood that the impious presumption of both civil and church authorities, who being themselves but fallible and uninspired men, have assumed dominion over the faith of others, setting up their own opinions and modes of thinking as the only true and infallible, and as such endeavoring to impose them on others, has established and maintained false religions over the greatest part of the world and through all time. You know, just a preview of the sermon tomorrow, because I think what he's seeing here, there's a dynamic where we substitute, we, we attribute to the Holy Spirit our own beliefs and attitudes and aspirations, and we say, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. And then it can't be challenged because it's, it's God, it's not me. And I think Jefferson saw that in his own way when he's talking about 
uh, setting up their own opinions and modes of thinking as the only true and infallible. So they attribute that these are not mine, these are God's. Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance is the one document that if you only read one document about religious freedom, this is the one you need to read. <clears throat> it was written to oppose an otherwise unremarkable bill simply to continue tax funding of the church and its schools that Patrick Henry proposed. But Madison and um, the New Light congregations of Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians would have none of this tax funding of the Anglicans. And Madison wrote very powerful political rhetoric, but, but a lot of meaning, and I'm only going to read small portions of it. We hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion, or the duty which we owe to our creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Now remember, he's writing this in the context of opposing tax funding of religion and religious schools. What did Arizona just pass this year? Is it $6,500, $7,000 for every kid that goes to private school? 80% or more of those are religious schools. The religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. Ellen White could have written that. You know, religion uh, only by love is love awakened. Religion must be voluntary. Uh, God will not coerce us. We maintain, therefore, that in matters of religion, no man's right is abridged by the institution of civil society and that religion is wholly exempt from its cognizance. Religion is not the business of government. It's interesting, you know, in the COVID, <sighs> I'm vaccinated. I took a dim view of religious objections to the vaccine. But I found myself defending um, a number of individuals who were fired um, because of their objections. And um, I'll just give you one example of, of the absurdity. Kaiser claims that they received 25,000 uh, exemption requests. And so they implemented a system of vigorous written interrogation of everybody in order to weed out the frauds. And to be fair, uh, you know, they were not uh, unwise to expect that there were those whose objections were not religious, but who were invoking a religious exception. But let me ask you, can you determine whether someone has a sincere religious belief because of what they write in answer to your questions on paper, that you've never looked them in the eyeball and asked them about their faith and why they won't get the vaccine. Now, I will tell you, our staff, we have screened dozens and dozens and dozens of cases, and we could tell really quickly who was sincere and who wasn't. Now, maybe that's because we have a faith background, and you know, we're kind of hip to some of this, but. Um, and maybe we were right and maybe we were wrong. You know, we're human. We may have made, but I mean, you have these companies that are just very, I can't tell you how many people have come to me who were working remotely and were fired. And, and, and what kind of a health threat did they pose to anybody if they're working remotely, right? So, you know, um, it's not the state's role to judge your religious belief, whether it makes sense, whether it's logical uh, or anything. You know, the state's role is simply to protect our freedom to believe. And 
yes, there are uh, legitimate interests in protecting public safety and public health and all of that. Um, on the issue, as he as Madison gets to the issue of tax funding, he says it is it's in that context. This is a famous quote of his: "It is proper to take alarm." at the first experiment on our liberties. And he says, who doesn't see that the same authority which can establish Christianity in exclusion of all other religions may establish with the same ease any particular sect of Christians in exclusion of all other sects. And I mean, that's pretty much what the experience was in colonial America. You had, you know, places where, for example, the Anglican church ruled the roost and uh, other places where uh, it was something else, like in New England. <clears throat> that the same authority which can force a citizen to contribute three pennies only of his property for the support of any one establishment can force him to conform to any other establishment in all cases whatsoever. And, and that three pence was not a rhetorical flourish. It was, in fact, there were Baptists who lost their property because they would not pay three pennies in property taxes to support the local church. So they didn't believe in that. And so referring to the taxation bill of Patrick Henry, he says that it implies either that the civil magistrate is a competent judge of religious truth or that he may employ religion as an engine of civil policy. The first, the idea that the uh, civil magistrate is a competent judge of religious truth, he says, is an arrogant pretension falsified by the contradictory opinions of rulers in all ages, right? And then, and throughout the world. The second, the idea that, you know, the magistrate can employ religion as an engine of civil policy is an unhallowed perversion of the means of salvation. These guys didn't cut, you know, they didn't mince words, right? They were very sharp and very insightful. And he says, uh, experience witnesses that ecclesiastical establishments, instead of maintaining the purity and efficacy um, of religion, have had a contrary operation. During almost 15 centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial. Think the 1260 years of prophecy, right? What have been its fruits? And the, the quote got cut off, but I have the rest of it in my notes. More or less in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and servility in the laity in both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. Right? So these guys are students of history. Madison spent a lot of time studying history, history of the church, the history of the state, different aspects of government, the Greeks, the Romans, etc. Very astute students of history. And he came to the conclusion that putting church and state together um, was a disaster, basically. And so vigorous advocates for the separation of church and state. I'm gonna keep going here. Um, we have heard a lot these days about what is a false historical narrative. America as a Christian nation. And in fact, since our Supreme Court particularly says that we need to look to our history and tradition to understand the Constitution, well, the administration of George Washington um, uh, negotiated a treaty with Tripoli. Our first foreign policy crisis was that our merchant vessels in the Mediterranean were being attacked by pirates from Tripoli, Barbary pirates, and we didn't have a Navy to defend them. And we negotiated a treaty that was signed by the Adams administration, the second president. So if you wanna look at, you know, what did our founding fathers believe about America as a Christian nation? Well, Let's see what they said 
when they were making a treaty, which is an official legal document having full force and effect of law, Article 11 was a very essential part of the treaty, which reads, as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the law's religion or tranquility of Muslims, Muslims, and as the said states never have entered into any war or act of hostility against any Mohammedan nation, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinions shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. The Trump administration should have read that before uh, uh, they started implementing what came to be known as the Muslim ban, right? America has never been formally a Christian nation. And by the way, there ain't a Christian in the country who wants it to be a Christian nation because uh, we don't want to beat our swords into plowshares. We don't want to become as a nation the meek who shall inherit the earth. And we don't want to treat our enemies, you know, we don't want to love our enemies and turn the other cheek. There's nobody that, you know, that doesn't work in a fallen world, right? That's not what we aspire to. Um, Okay, well, we could go into all of the dragon speaking. I'll simply point out that as a matter of our own Adventist history, Alonzo T. Jones cited American imperialism against Spain in the latter part of the, 19th, of the 1800s as evidence of dragon speaking. If he were alive today, I wonder what he would say about our preemptive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't know if you're inclined this way. I finally, now that it's outside of a paywall, I've been watching Homeland and its picture of American interventions in Afghanistan are quite insightful in, in many, many ways. <laughs> so coming back to our passage, we have an emphasis here on worship. Worshiping the first beast, making an image of that first beast. Now, when it says that the second beast makes an image, what Old Testament passage does it remind you of? Who made an image? Nebuchadnezzar made an image. And then in the next chapter, what did he do? He made everybody bow down to the image, right? Chapter three. And here, we don't just make everybody bow down. We breathe life into the image and it speaks. How many commandments do we see violated here? So it's the worship of the beast. So to begin with, let's see, what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before you. So there's another God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, if you're worshiping another God, um, and Jesus says they're doing it in Christ's name, right? Many will come in my name and deceive many. So they're taking Christ's name in vain. They're doing it in the name of Jesus. Um, they're making an image. Okay, so it's very idolatrous. You know, what's ironic here is there's no direct reference to the fourth commandment, and yet that's the one that we Adventists put the most emphasis on. 
And I'm not saying that we're wrong to do that because I think it's, you know, in contrast with uh, the first angel's message that calls us to return to the creator who's identified by, you know, creating heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Um, so I do think that, that we can legitimately find the Sabbath here that all of the commandments that pertain to our relationship with God are violated and counterfeited. It's complete and utter rebellion and, and uh, rebellion against God, right? And it's the bringing together of church and state. Um, it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. The first beast, Adventism has been prone to talking about the papacy, about Catholicism. Um, I like a different approach that I got from our buddy Tim Golden, who talks about, he teaches, a, he teaches philosophy at Walla Walla, talks about the Constantinian church-state relations. You know, because now it's sort of more academic it's more polite okay so constantine you know really brought church and state together and by the end of the century the bishop of rome exercised dominion over the emperor and the 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 roles were reversed okay but all the authority of the first beast in its presence it suggests a return to a Constantinian view of church-state relations, where the state then does the service of the church, right? And we don't need to be anti-Catholic. You know, my stepson began to date a Filipina gal years ago who was from a Catholic family, and she didn't know anything. And I said to my wife, she's going to make a really good Adventist. <laughs> Because all she had to do was start coming to church with Chris, and she was going to start learning. And, you know, it's, uh, it's so clear, you know, Catholics don't have anything against the Bible or anything. And if you just start teaching them, you know, they, they're very responsive, you know. And um, we, we, we tend to want to practice a religion of us against them but that's the religion of the beast is the us against them yeah. you know so like there's there's a word that we have that i think we need to somehow um we should use the f word more than we use this word and and adventists you know we don't believe in using the f word so this word that we should banish is the word non-adventist how would you like to be a non you know, if a Catholic said, "Oh, you're 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 a non-Catholic," you know, I mean, it's it's an it's a word that makes somebody into the other. You don't want to be the other. Exercises all the authority, which is to say, civil and religious authority, and it speaks. It gives breath to the image and causes those who do not worship the image to be slain. So the civil power is manipulated to impose these sanctions, can't buy or sell, to be slain. Um, you know who the greatest champion of Christian civil civilization and the union of church and state is in the planet today? Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin mocks the West as decadent, immoral, and corrupt because of abortion, because of gay rights and gay marriage. And Russia is the defender of Christian civilization. And Putin has made his alliance with the patriarch, Kirill, who has made the most outrageous sermons in support of that. What do they call it? He's not calling it a war. What is he calling it? 
a special operation or yeah. something in in Ukraine, right? Um, it is no surprise that if the the Republicans win back Congress, they intend to cut support for Ukraine. It's no surprise that they, who for decades were famously anti-communist, are now pro-Russian. Yes, that's about the only thing one can say. So it's the worship of the beast, which is to say the worship of the American God. It's idolatry because it worships. A, what is a beast in prophecy? It's a nation. So the worship of the beast and the image of the beast is the worship of the nation, which is to say it is love of country and patriotism, which are perfectly good things on their own, but it's taken to an idolatrous extreme. And it's done in the name of Jesus. It's a blending of God and country, of faith and patriotism. Church and state united, working together. And of course, Revelation 17, we get some clarity because we see the harlot, the woman, which is a symbol of the church, sitting on top of the beast. Um, if you're going to ride a powerful animal that weighs, uh, you know, 10 times or more than you do. You better be in control of that thing or you're in big trouble, right? Uh, my wife and I are going to the state championship equestrian championships tomorrow as we um, are part of that community. And we love horses and have some horses. And uh, you're going to get on a horse. And you better be in control of that animal or you're going to be hurt, right? The woman is riding on the beast. She's holding the reins. She's calling the shots. The church is in control of the state. And we're seeing that more and more here in our country, the church and state blending together. But that'll be our discussion tomorrow afternoon. Um, using legislation to impose the will of the church, or as Ellen White says, to enforce her dogmas and execute her decrees in a way ultimately that proves to be intolerant, uh, exclusive, persecuting dissenters, others, and it is fear-based. Resist a politics of fear, resist a religion of fear. And interestingly enough, we Adventists, we, we pride ourselves that we're commandment keepers. Uh, and, and we point to the fourth commandment because of how many words it has. It's got to be really important because it has more words than all the others, right? <laughs> but you know what commandment is repeated more than any other commandment in all of the Bible? Don't be afraid. Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the king, right? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the fire, it will not burn you. Right? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So God commands us not to be afraid. And in fact, go back and read Psalm 46 and Psalm 119, because those are apocalyptic psalms if ever there was one. You know, you'll not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that thousand may fall at thy side, right? But it won't come near you. But did you hear the first part? You will not be afraid. He doesn't say, don't be afraid. He says, you won't be afraid. Because God is with you. We have to reject this divisiveness and this fear-based everything. The worship of the American God persecutes those who don't worship the image. It's exclusive. It's us against them, my way or the highway, fear-based. It is violent. It unites church and state. Now, <clears throat> last, last little point here before we close.
you look around, it's spoken of in universal terms, all small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, worship, peace. Look at all the vast differences in culture and religion around the world. How on earth is everybody going to come together around this idolatrous worship? Obviously, it's going to be more than um, anything that would normally occur. But I think we see a, a historical precedent in John chapter 11, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And the rabbis get together and they're very upset because they expect that, you know, this is really going too far now. And Jesus is going to cause such a tumult and a disruption that the Roman armies are going to come and they're going to basically destroy the nation and destroy their power as, you know, leaders of the nation. And, you know, if you think about it, this was not an unreasonable fear that they had. They were not paranoid. And in fact, a generation later, the Romans came and did just that. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed Jerusalem. And then you had the Jewish diaspora for the next, you know, uh, hundreds and thousands of years, right? Until 1948. So the rabbis are saying, you know, what are we going to do? This is going to really be bad. And Caiaphas, who was serving as high priest, he says, don't you realize it is expedient that one man die to save the nation? Now, I don't know what is going to bring everybody to the place where they say it is expedient that these people who don't get with the program, that they must die to save the world. But we said that the mark of the beast is a counterfeit of the plan of salvation. There is a counterfeit salvation, but it's not individual. It's the nation. It's the world. It's Ellen White speaks about uh, they will call us enemies of law and order, bringing the judgments of God upon the land. Right? So... It's, it's some other kind of salvation. Anyway, just some food for thought. I'm, I'm not trying to predict the future. I'm just trying to get, gain some insight from the word of God. Now, I lied. One more insight here. The drive, the church's drive for power is contrary to every, every principle of scripture. Jesus said, he who would be great among you should be as a servant, right? Um, Acts chapter 1. The disciples of Jesus, they're sensing that some momentous event is about to take place. They had been rooted and grounded in the notion of Messiah as conquering king who would come and establish his kingdom and his throne in Jerusalem. And even with all they had been through with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, they had never lost sight of this. It was so deeply ingrained in them. And so their question to Jesus in Acts chapter 1, Lord, is it at this time that you will establish the kingdom? They're still thinking about, and while you're at it, can I sit on the right and the left? And he says to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll, 
be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. And then take it up from them. There's a wonderful contrast in the text between two words. The exousia, the authority retained by the father alone, the authority to rule, to establish the kingdom. And the power of the Holy Spirit that is given to the church, which in the Greek is the word dunamis. The church has never been given the exousia. God has never committed to the church power to rule on this earth. But he has given us a different power. He says, <clears throat> it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. Don't worry about that. You will receive a different power. You'll be my witnesses when the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The same word that we get, you know, dynamite, dynamic, right? The only power that God has ever given to the church is the power of the Holy Spirit. And with that power, the disciples of Christ turned human history upside down and changed the world. In Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, Ellen White is commenting on the part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is, is teaching about uh, not worrying about the speck in your brother's eye, but dealing with the log in your own eye. And, and she makes this statement, what the church has done whenever she has lost the grace of Christ finding herself destitute of the power of love, she's reached out for the strong arm of the state. You see why I put this in this study? As we're talking about the church using the power of the state to enforce her dogmas and decrees and the mark of the beast. Here is the secret of all religious laws that have ever been enacted. And the secret of all persecution from the days of Abel to our own time. Christ does not drive, but draws men unto him. This is as simple as clear a statement of religious liberty. Very consistent with what we read from Madison and Jefferson. <clears throat> the only compulsion which Christ employs is the constraint of love. When the church begins to seek for the support of secular power, and we'll look at some of that history tomorrow afternoon, because uh, that took place uh, a generation ago, at least. When the church begins to seek for the support of secular power, it is evident that she's devoid of the dunamis power that is her only inheritance. The dunamis power, the devoid of the power of Christ the constraint of divine love. And this is the spiritual indictment of the American church. She has lost the grace of Christ. She's lost the power of the, whole, of the genuine Holy Spirit. And she is drowning and grasping for political power to rescue her from her own um, corruption. So my thesis is simply this is my very last slide. The religion, oops, the religion of Revelation 13 is fully formed. It is the dominant religion in America today. The image of the beast is fully formed. The threefold union is fully formed. We'll talk about the threefold union tomorrow. American religion worships the American God an idolatrous counterfeit. <clears throat> and I wish I could tell you that Adventists were immune, but we're not. 
because we have very much similar, many respects, similar values and beliefs as our uh, Christian brothers and sisters. And for many of us, uh, we're caught up in the same politics. And um, I fear for the fate of, of some of my Adventist brothers and sisters. I do. Which is why I have to keep preaching this no matter where I go. Well, you know, I always feel like I can let my hair down when I'm in a black church. So the presentation went just a little longer than it did in camp meeting time when I think I was on a solid hour exactly. But thank you for your patience. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know it's late. It's Friday night. We're probably tired. But if, if, if we want to have a few comments or discussion for just a few minutes before we close, um, we can do that. Okay, immediately afterwards, we have prepared refreshments. And so there are refreshments for you there in the fellowship hall. So we can take a couple of questions, but they can chat with you over in the fellowship hall. Okay, all right, so we can do that. Connie. I, I will tell you, I've had a pretty rough week, but I, I'll stay for a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> I've been interested to see what you would your remarks about the the Jewish schools in New York recently that were found fraudulently using federal funds. I'm not aware of it. Oh, it was it was big last week before last, I think, at the New York Times. They were it was millions of dollars. They were saying that they were using them for student lunches and instead were using them for all sorts of personal reasons. And oh my god, a slap on the hands. But I was wondering how did they get all that federal funding in Jewish schools. <laughs> well, um, there it, there are different types of funds um, for school lunches, for one, um, and for different kinds of remedial services. You know, <clears throat> the um, the establishment clause cases for a long time um, were really about exceptions to the rule that you can't give funds directly to religious schools. And they kept whittling it down and making exceptions after exceptions until the exceptions swallowed the rule. Um, and it used to be that, you know, the, the rule was you don't fund religion. Now the rule is if you fund something secular and don't fund religion, that's discrimination. They've completely turned it upside down. Um, you know, I saw this, the, the faith-based initiative was rolled out during the Bush years, the early Bush years. In circa 2002, the middle of his first administration, I remember the dog and pony show coming to San Diego and uh, at the convention center there. What it really was, frankly, was an attempt to seduce inner city churches black and Hispanic churches with government funds to get them to vote Republican it was very, very political. Now, the folks who authored it, I know them as well, and they're very sincere Pentecostal-leaning um, Christians who believe in, you know, government funding, that the churches should have access and, you know, providing the various services should, should have access to the funds. So I asked the, at the breakout, I don't remember his name now, it's been 20 years, but uh, he was one of the top honchos there in, in, in the initiative. And so I asked the question, well, what about churches that receive these funds directly without setting up a separate 501c3? Aren't they subject to audit? And is that a good idea? And he admitted that, yes, they are subject to audit and that that um, is a reason why they might want to 
go to the trouble of setting up a separate organization. Now, you know, lots of churches have organizations like we have ADRA. ADRA gets millions of dollars of government funds, but it's supposed to be providing not a religious service, but a secular service that you know, we, we may engage in for religious reasons, but they are secular services that the government wants to, to provide. Um, recently on the news, Phoenix uh, is now doing its own program of homeless shelters and not just funding nonprofits to provide shelter for homeless people. Well, you know, government traditionally uh, does a little bit of both. They provide some services directly, but a lot of times they will provide funding to the nonprofit sector to provide various services that government feels are important to provide. Uh, that's perfectly fine, except when it comes to the teaching and promulgation of religion. Because what we were reading from our founding fathers is government should not be in the business of you know, facilitating the teaching of the faith. That's something. And, and, and you know, <clears throat> here's the thing. I got into an interest 